Well, let's talk about taxes and tax cuts. Let's talk about the Bush administration tax cuts. There's been arguments that those uh, should be made permanent. We should continue with them. Do you believe those cuts should be continued? Darcy Berner? We, um, certainly all of the tax cuts that affect the middle class should be continued. The last thing we want to do in this kind of economy is raise taxes on people who um, are the engines of this economy. Furthermore, I've actually proposed modifying that package to provide more in tax cuts to the middle class. Let me repeat, I want to cut taxes further for the middle class by doing things like doubling the standard deduction, doubling the child independent care tax credit, and making the sales tax deduction, which is so important in this state, permanent. That's about $4,000 a year for the average family in this district. Um, we can do that. And we have to do that as an economic stimulus right now. Um, I've actually laid out a plan for how we do that. My opponent apparently thinks that the status quo is entirely the way to go. Um, so people have a real choice. Do they like the status quo? Do they like the direction that the economy has gone? Do they think that what we have right now is working? Or do they think that we ought to have people in Congress like me who are going to prioritize the middle class? and make sure that we deliver to the American middle class the benefits of their work that they deserve. Congressman. Well, um, I grew up in a family that uh, struggled quite a bit financially, so I really think I'm very much in touch with the middle class. And over my 33-year uh, career as a member of the sheriff's office, uh, I worked with lots of people who struggled. And I have great compassion and understanding uh, for those people who are uh, struggling. I was one of those. And grew up in one of those families. Uh, my opponent can't have it both ways. Uh, look, I was criticized by my opponent for voting against the Democrat budget, which in order to balance PAYGO, a pay-as-you-go system that the Democrats instituted in January of last year, the, um, the tax cuts that we're speaking about uh, were used to balance the budget. So those tax cuts went away. When those tax cuts go away, and that budget passed uh, because the Democrats, again, are in the majority. The budget passed, the tax cuts go away. In 2010, for a family of four making $65,000 a year, your taxes will increase by $4,000 per family, per year. Now, you either for pay go or you're not. There's only two other ways you can pay for it. One, you can cut huge cuts from some programs that people are afraid to cut. Or you can borrow more money. And what they chose to do in the PAYGO bill, the Democrats' budget bill, was to eliminate those tax cuts for the middle American and those hardworking Americans that my opponent just said she was for. Uh, Congressman, let me uh, ask you about a uh, ad that your uh, campaign is running. It just hit the airwaves here, I guess, last week. And it claims that your opponent calls for higher federal taxes. Substantiate that claim for us. Well, I, I, I just explained it. Uh, the, the higher federal taxes would be uh, you eliminate the tax cuts in 2010. They sunset for a family of four making $65,000 a year. Um, you're going to increase your taxes by $4,000. The, the tax plan that she has attached to her economic plan is a standard deduction double, double the standard deduction, but she also includes in that that you can itemize your uh, tax deductions. Well, you can't combine two tax forms. One form is a standardized deduction. The other is an itemized deduction. You can't combine and take itemized deduction if you use a standardized form. So there's no $4,000 tax break for, the, for the, uh, the average American there. The numbers don't add up. If the tax credit for child tax credit, for example, let's just take that, is eliminated because of PAYGO and the Democrat budget, the child, child tax credit at the end of 2010 will be zero. She wants to double the child tax credit. Well, zero plus zero is zero. Are you interested, Ms. Berner, in raising the federal taxes? Is that uh, part of the not, game plan? I am not, of course. I, I have said repeatedly, and let me say it again, I want to cut taxes for the middle class. Um, I find it really interesting that my opponent can't find anything in my actual positions to attack. And so rather they're running ads that simply make things up. The Seattle Times yesterday, once again for the second time recently, pointed out that when he makes these claims, they have no basis in fact. 
I want to lower taxes for the American middle class, ensure that the tax cuts that they have right now continue, and furthermore, help them more to stimulate the economy by cutting their taxes further. We need an economic stimulus to get this country back on track. The economic policies of the last eight years have failed the American middle class. When the average family is $10,000 a year worse off now than they were eight years ago, it's pretty clear that what we have right now isn't working. And my proposal is that we focus on that economic stimulus by helping the American middle class, by helping the family in Kent, the single mother in Covington, the person in Enumclaw or Eatonville or Graham or Buckley who needs a break. And that's exactly what I propose doing. All right, let's, uh, Ms. Berger, let's talk about uh, a television ad that you have running uh, that claims that Congressman Reichert has been ineffective in Congress. Uh, the ad claims that in the four years that Mr. Reichert has been in Congress, uh, he's only passed one bill. You substantiate that for us. Well, that's fairly straightforward. There are these nonpartisan services, both that rank members of Congress in terms of their ability to influence and affect things in the Congress, as well as that identify what legislation each member of Congress has passed. Now, Congressman Reichert two years ago was very happy to talk about his congressional power ranking, but less happy now because at the moment he's 401st out of 439, dead last in the Washington state delegation, and below the non-voting members from American Samoa and Guam. The people of the 8th District would get better, more effective representation if they sent a delegate who can't even vote than they're getting from Congressman Reichert. Um, and if you look at these nonpartisan services that, that show you what each member of Congress has accomplished, they demonstrate that Congressman Reichert has not been effective for this district. We have really serious problems that this country is facing right now. And we need people in Congress who are up to the task of addressing them. My background in economics, my background in the private sector, my background in technology in one of the most tech-savvy districts in the entire country is going to give me the tools to go adequately, more than adequately, really well represent this district far beyond what Congressman Riker has been able to do, which is why I've asked the voters of this district to make sure that they send me to Congress in November. Congressman, how do you respond to that ad? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, I, I became uh, the uh, sixth chairman uh, as a freshman in the history of this country. My ninth month in Congress, uh, I was made a chairman of a subcommittee. And that's where the power rankings have changed. And it's, it's not a, a compilation of organization. It's one organization. And yes, we were proud of the fact, and we did take advantage of that poll, and we, we bragged about it. But let me just make the record clear. I've passed 10 pieces of legislation uh, in this uh, last four years that I've been in Congress. And uh, um, if my opponent believes I'm an effective uh, we, we probably ought to talk about Norm Dix, and since he's only passed four pieces of legislation, and he's one of the most powerful members of Congress, according to the same study, uh, he should be, have an opponent who, who, who replaces him. I have ten pieces of legislation, six, of, six amendments, uh, two resolutions, and uh, Adam Smith has two pieces of legislation to my ten. All you need to do is go to the Congressional Library site, uh, Congressional Resource Center, do a little bit of research, and you'll discover that, you know, it's not always about putting your name on a bill. You, you present a bill, the language in your bill gets incorporated in another person's bill, and the chairman or this, the ranking member take that bill, put their name on it, but your language moves forward. All right. Let, let me go back to taxes. Under what circumstances would you support a tax increase? Congressman? Well, in these, in these times right now, there should be no tax. This is the worst time to talk about raising taxes on anything or anybody. Uh, we are in a, a, a financial crisis right, right now, as everyone knows. What we should be focused on right now is, again, we've got to have 
We should have these hearings. These financial experts have to come in. We do and we are right now in that process. Collect information, find out exactly why we're in this mess. We don't take $700 billion of the taxpayers' money and, and, uh, and, and just pour it into Wall Street to rescue uh, Wall Street, to uh, uh, provide parachutes for some of these the CEOs that we've, we've talked about uh, earlier. What we, what we must do, though, is protect the taxpayers' investment. Now, there are some things built into the bill that, that does that to some degree. Um, it, by providing some insurance premiums that you know financial institutions who participate in this program have to pay back to the government, which then recoups some of the $700 billion, but it's not enough. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I voted against the bill. First of all, it was shoved down our throat. Secondly, we didn't have a legislative process. And third, it doesn't do enough to protect the taxpayer's investment in this. If you go uh, along with my opponent's tax plan, and, and uh, what you want to do is increase taxes. Uh, you take $12 billion out of the 8th District, and you send it back to Washington State, or Washington, D.C., okay. and it ends up in Congress. Wall Street. Sprinter? Um, I agree that now is not the right time to increase taxes. Um, the economic crisis that we have on our hands requires a stimulus. This is exactly the sort of period in which we want to have had a rainy day fund saved up so that we could make greater investments in growing the economy. Unfortunately, that rainy day fund has been squandered and we're going to have to go further and further into debt. Frankly, in the five years that my son has been alive, the national debt has doubled at the hands of people like Congressman Reichert. We have to have policies that are going to grow the economy, make the middle class stronger, and not leave our children with a tremendous mountain of debt. I mean, once we pull out of this economic crisis, once we get the economy growing again, I think it's a very reasonable thing to ask profitable corporations to pay their fair share, to ask the very wealthy who benefit most from the investments that we make in the economy to pay their fair share, which is something that Congressman Reichert has never been willing to do. When is, whenever it has come down to difficult choices, do we keep our promises to the men and women who have served this country in the military by providing them educational benefits? If we also are going to pay for it, he has voted against it because he's not actually willing to pay for the things he says he thinks we need. We can change that. We can get better representation in Washington, D.C., but we can only do it if we change who we send to Congress. Let me, let me follow up uh, because I, I, I'm curious as to is there ever a circumstance when you would support a tax increase? Well, I, I think that is a, that's a question. I mean, certainly a hypothetical question. I think when, when um, I, you know, I, I would be against raising taxes unless this country is in, involved in a conflict that is, uh, you know, so, so dire. So, I mean, we're going down a road here where um, we, we, um, We cannot raise taxes on uh, uh, companies, on people, on uh, individuals, on families. Uh, and, you know, that's where I am today. I can't see myself supporting uh, a tax increase uh, at, 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 at this point in, in history. But I have to go back and, and remind people that the Democrats are the ones who are running Congress right now. And for someone like me, who my opponent says is ineffective, uh, I've just been uh, uh, accused of, uh, so far on this program, of raising the deficit uh, yeah. all on my own. Let's leave it there, Congressman. We're out of time. Go ahead, Ms. Burner. You have a minute. Um, every household in this district understands what it's like to balance your books and how important that is. Uh, I mean, I was in Buckley last night talking to people who were talking about how difficult it is to make ends meet. But every household in this country has to do it, has to figure out how to make sure that what they're spending matches what's coming in. Most of the states in this country have to figure out how to make sure that what they're spending isn't more than what they're bringing in. We have to be willing to make investments in our country, investments in our schools, in our roads, in transportation, in new technologies to grow the economy. 
And to make those investments, we have to have revenue coming in. Do I think everyone, um, particularly profitable corporations and the very wealthy, should pay their fair share? Absolutely, they benefit most from this. My opponent told the Seattle Times that he thinks that we should, we, should, we should cut taxes for wealthy investors and corporations as his priority. Okay. That's broken. You have to leave it there. All right. Let's talk.